everyone. I think we're ready to begin. Uh, I am extremely happy to have with us today Vicky Calogera from Northwestern University. Uh, Vicky is coming back to us. She did hear her postdoc a few years ago, just a few. Few, <laughs> several to many. <laughs> About 17, uh, right? <laughs> but it's, a, it's few among friends. Um, and um, and uh, so I'm sure that many of you remember her, but just a recap. Vicky did her PhD in University of Illinois. Uh, she graduated at 97. She then moved here as a CFA fellow, uh, and then she got the Clay Fellow. Um, and then in 2001, she joined Northwestern University uh, faculty. Vicky is the co-founder and director of Sierra. Sierra is a wonderful center. It's called the Center. I'm sorry, I never behind you. <laughs> yes, the Center of Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics, which I had the privilege of be there to be there for about a, a year and a half or something like that, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, it was great. This is how we know each other. Um, Vicky is doing uh, a lot of interesting research in compact objects, and it's uh, neutron stars, black holes, uh, in binaries, without binaries, with gravitational waves, without spins, kick. It's it's very uh, it's very rich and interesting. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that Vicky serves as a role model for many of us young. Uh, I, I, I asked you if there's specific something that you want me to say, you said no. So I decided to say what I really feel, <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I really feel that you are serving as a role model for many of us. So thank you. And without further ado, you go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Smadar. I knew that it was a bad idea that you were introducing me. I should have said no. Um, There's no choice. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back here. I, uh, pleasure to see again many friends uh, and also some new faces. I've had a great day and I know I have more meetings tomorrow. Um, so today I would like to uh, give you a bit of a recap of where we stand with LIGO and try and get you once again all excited about uh, what LIGO might bring uh, to uh, us astronomers. I'm actually part of my group at Northwestern. Uh, we're a member of the uh, LIGO scientific collaboration. Uh, we're married, as we say, to Virgo, but we're not one collaboration. And in um, the last few years, uh, having started in the astrophysics of gravitational wave sources, the last few years I've become more interested actually in uh, data analysis and, and developing methodologies for extracting information from LIGO data. Um, so, as I said, that the advanced era of gravitational wave detectors is actually around the corner. I don't know if you realize, but a year from now uh, is the plan that advanced LIGO will come online for the first time. Um, uh, it will not have a design sensitivity, like initial LIGO did not have design sensitivity initially, but, uh, but things will be happening uh, already in one year. So LIGO. Uh, at Hanford and at Louisiana will come online in March two, 2015. The project has been on budget and on time for many years now, so we're all very uh, confident about this timeline and at the same time scared to death. Um, uh, and then Virgo uh, hopefully will join us coming online in 2016. Uh, LIGO India is actually a, uh, a laser interferometer in India that will be established in collaboration with LIGO. And the Indian government has approved it. There's a few levels of approval on the US side, but we think that this will become a reality, but that will come a few years later towards 2020 or 2021. Um, so let me get started first things first, uh, just bring everybody on the same page and remind you some very basic uh, things about gravitational waves. It connects to Einstein's theory of general relativity and the concept that uh, the existence of mass basically curves space-time around it and it affects the, how uh, the distances between reference undisturbed uh, points. These space-time deformations are actually, can actually be propagated and communicated through the generation and propagation of gravitational waves, and the waves are transverse waves propagating at the speed of light. Um, one difference with gravitational waves compared to electromagnetic waves is that they are of quadruple nature. 
Uh, there are oscillatory disturbances of space-time, and they have two polarizations, each one at 45 degrees. So the overall signal, the gravitational wave strain, as we call it, is a combination of the two polarizations. Uh, the strain is this little uh, H in the two polarizations, and the F factors are basically uh, the projections of the signal on the detectors. And these are the two antenna patterns that are characteristic of the LIGO detectors. <clears throat> So, as I said, one polarization is actually what we call the plus polarization. This gravitational wave strain uh, basically is proportional to the relative change in the distances between reference points. And in this plus polarization, what the reference points experience is this kind of very characteristic um, uh, oscillation that you see there. And if you have a whole wave propagating in this direction, you can see here at the front the plus uh, oscillation and how it looks if you actually have a wavefront. Now, if you put the X polarization, you have the combination of the two, and you can see how you basically get, actually, this way, uh, um, uh, circular polar polarization as well. <clears throat> now, gravitational waves are very weak. That's part of the challenge uh, with dealing with, uh, uh, with actually detecting them correctly. Uh, part uh, has to do with the fact that the gravitational uh, wave strain is proportional to G and this factor of C to the fourth in the denominator here. And overall, basically, uh, it's the gravitational wave strain is proportional to the Schwarzschild radius or the um, uh, mass of the object you're dealing with, how fast it's moving, and it better be moving close to relativistic speeds, and how far away it is. So this is an amplitude of the oscillation, so it's proportional to one over the distance, and this is the signal we're trying to detect. So you want to have highly compact, fast moving, and of course nearby objects as always in astronomy. Now, for the direct detection, uh, the, the goal is to measure these relative distance changes. So the value of H is important. And just to calibrate a little bit your um, um, uh, sense of scale, if we had a black hole at 10 solar masses um, at, uh, uh, accelerated close to the speed of light, at the galactic center, this H, this fractional change in distances that LIGO is supposed to measure, is of the order of one uh, part in 10 to the 17. And if you're at the Virgo cluster, it's one part 10 to the 20. Actually, uh, we need to go to even higher sensitivities because you're not dealing with 10 solar masses and you're not moving at the speed of light. And you also want to see further away than the Virgo cluster. <clears throat> so. Uh, the LIGO project started with what we refer to as initial LIGO. Um, the way that, uh, we're pursuing direct detection is by having these two detectors in Hanford, uh, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana. And uh, a few years later, Virgo, uh, an Italian-French collaboration from Europe, joined as well. The main concept, and I will not spend much time on the uh, technical aspect of the detector, but the main concept is basically an interferometer where you have a beam splitter of a, uh, a laser comes through. Two laser, uh, uh, lasers propagate down the two arms, and uh, they come back. And from the interference, you can figure out what's going on with these test masses here in suspension, and you can measure this fractional uh, uh, change in distance you might be interested in. Now, um, a couple of things on this plot. First of all, I mentioned initial LIGO. It came online in 2002, uh, and it took five years of commissioning while in parallel taking data to reach design sensitivity. Uh, so what you see here is a standard LIGO noise plot. This is an expression, a measure of the gravitational wave strain spectrum um, uh, as a function of frequency. And these are noise curves. The main sources of noise is that you have photon shot noise from the uh, lasers, thermal noise from the uh, suspended masses. And of course, the Earth is producing a lot of noise by shaking the ground on which the detectors are lying. So what you see here, the different colors, is the progression of the sensitivity curve of the instrument as a function of this measure of gravitational wave strain, as a function of time. 2002 is green, 2007 is the purple. So the design promise, sorry, I can't point exactly on the black line, but that's the one, that was the design sensitivity. So it took five years of hard work in commissioning and understanding the detector, but it was done. 
One problem with the noise I mentioned, it looks, um, when, when you see these solid curves, it looks very smooth uh, and nice behaving, but in reality, it's non-Gaussian and non-stationary. And that's a major, as, as most detectors, and that's a major issue that uh, I'll come back at some point later in the talk. Okay. 2007 design sensitivity was achieved. By 2009 and 10, uh, uh, the best strain, strain sensitivities actually uh, surpassed the design uh, requirement. So both LIGO and Hanford were under. Uh, and the requirement was for 100 hertz out to, uh, I think, uh, 400 hertz. So in terms of the engineering aspects, things were going superbly well. Virgo joined uh, eventually in 2011. Virgo reached its best sensitivity. Not as good as LIGO in the frequencies above 100 hertz, but as you can see, much better uh, at lower frequencies. So there is a synergy between the two uh, detectors. <clears throat> now, another way to measure, uh, to get a sense of what these sensitivities really mean, is to ask the following question. Take a, uh, a double neutron star, which is sort of the classic expected gravitational wave source that we know emits gravitational waves, and ask the question, if I have two standard neutron stars, 1.4 solar masses or so, and they are in spiraling, um, uh, how far away could LIGO see them, initial LIGO? And how far away is basically a little over 20 uh, megaparsecs for the red curve, which is LIGO, and the purple curve is Virgo. Now, you can ask the same question, how far away can I see a double compact object, black holes now, as a function of the total mass? And at 25 solar masses, obviously two black holes uh, we're dealing with here, out to more than 200 megaparsecs. If you go to even higher masses, if they exist, initial LIGO basically reached 0.7 gigaparsecs for a 100 solar mass total uh, for a, a binary black hole uh, system. So this, is, this gives you a sense of what initial LIGO was able to do. From initial to advanced, initial for double neutron stars reached a little over 20 megaparsecs, I said, so roughly Virgo supercluster. What we want to do is push the sensitivity to reach a volume that's 10 a, a distance that's 10 times higher and go uh, reach uh, out to local superclusters. And the volume will be roughly 1,000 times bigger. So the question that for many years concerned me uh, and, and was always asked and is always asked is, okay, what do you expect to see if you have a given sensitivity for LIGO? So this will not be a rates uh, talk. I'm done with rates. I'm looking at Ramesh. Ramesh, it's your fault. No, <laughs> it was your advice. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I, I'll just summarize the punchline of what we expect in terms of rain, uh, uh, event rates. There's two main paths for rate estimations. One is empirical, because we know double neutron stars exist in our galaxy, and we can model the pulsars and the selection effects associated with pulse, pulsar detection to figure out uh, how many double neutron stars we might have in our galaxy hiding and out to other galaxies. So uh, there's an empirical way, and then there is a theoretical way from a priori ab initio binary evolution simulations. You can use the double neutron star empirical rates to constrain the models and then make predictions for neutron star black holes and binary black holes. And um, uh, I did this for many years within my group. And we now have a LIGO collaboration publication that summarizes the rates. So that's all I'm going to do about rates, just to give you a sense of what to expect. So back in 2010, um, there was a collaboration publication that was basically a review, uh, including results from many other uh, groups. And what we expect now for advanced LIGO is that at design sensitivity, um, we might have hundreds of detections, or we might have still less than one. Now, I should say these models that give you these very low end uh, uh, numbers are extremely, they're considered to be extreme in their astrophysics, okay? So we cannot exclude them. Hopefully we will exclude them with LIGO, but we don't, it's not what we're expecting. Uh, realistic rates based on very standard astrophysical assumptions without pushing parameter or either in the plus or in the minus direction would give you a few tens of events per year. So if this were a probability distribution between 0.4 and 400, the peak is at, at, at around 40, <clears throat> okay? 
uh, with a tail at low numbers. So uh, big uncertainties, but there is real confidence that by the time LIGO and Virgo reach design sensitivity, we should see something. And in fact, we should see many sources. And that's when we can be doing uh, astronomy. So the plan for advanced LIGO is the following. I said next year it's coming online. It's going to have a three-month run, then six-month run in 2016 accompanied with Virgo, nine-month run 1718, and past 2018 we hope to be a design sensitivity. Again, as a function of date, we would be going for uh, LIGO. We would be turning on at about 40 or 60 or 80, 40 to 80 megabars sensitivity for double neutron stars. And gradually, we're hoping to reach 200. Okay, that's your factor of 10. <clears throat> and Virgo design sensitivity will be a little uh, 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 lower in the bulk in terms of detecting double neutron stars. Another way of seeing this progression is that uh, we'll have to go through the same commissioning uh, transition from 2015 to design sensitivity. Uh, I, I expect design sensitivity 2018. I think the promise to the NSF is 2019, <coughs> just to be safe. But you can see what kinds of big steps we're expecting from the three months to the six months to the nine months run until we hit design sensitivity. So. Before I get to tell you about many things that we're preoccupied with right now in terms of preparing uh, for advanced LIGO and making it a success, I'd like to summarize at the level of one slide per result the punchlines of astrophysically relevant results we've had already from uh, initial uh, LIGO observations and Virgo. <clears throat> so sticking to binary compact objects, we have uh, been able to set great upper limits um, uh, and what you see here is for the three categories, binary neutron stars, neutron star black hole, binary black hole, the blue big bars are the predictions, and these are the upper limits uh, derived from LIGO, 90% upper limits, and for more massive black holes, actually, it, it went very close to the predictions. So we're not there yet, but there is no question that if advanced LIGO works the way initial LIGO worked, there's no question the upper limits are going to start cutting into this astrophysically relevant space. Uh, another result has to do with following up two relatively close short gamma ray bursts. There were uh, two short gamma ray bursts um, um, uh, overlaid with uh, M31 and M101, right? A 81, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and LIGO went back, analyzed data, and asked the question, uh, can we say anything about the source of these short gamma ray bursts? And the answer was that basically, if the event was indeed in M31, then we can exclude at 99% confidence level that it was an in spiral involving uh, a neutron star. And same for M81, at high confidence levels, you can exclude that these short gamma ray bursts were actually um, uh, in spirals. So they are either compatible with in spirals happening at much bigger distances, so the exclusion distances are uh, given here, or it was some kind of a neutron star quake that happened within these two galaxies, soft gamma ray repeaters. So the upper limits here helped sort of assess the fact that short gamma ray bursts don't always uh, get produced by binary compact objects. People have used um, uh, thousands of electromagnetic burst triggers from magnetars to try and identify set limits on how much energy uh, could go into gravitational waves uh, for these various bursts, and the limits are uh, quite uh, uh, significant at some uh, level in terms of our understanding of how magnetars work and what's the origin of these energies. Also, LIGO data have been used to follow up hundreds of gamma ray bursts. If you analyze them as regular bursts, assuming you have this kind of mass involved in the uh, burst, then you can derive a distribution of exclusion distances. So meaning if this event was a burst with this kind of energy uh, at 115 her 50 hertz, then the median exclusion distance is 17 megaparsecs. So the event must have been further away than that. 
You can also do the same analysis, and it has been done. All this infrastructure of data analysis has been developed. Uh, you can ask the question, okay, what if they are double neutral stars or neutral star black holes? Can I uh, uh, extract, can I also make a statement about uh, exclusion uh, distances? You don't have to assume an energy. You know what you expect from these binaries in terms of gravitational waves. And you can also set um, uh, limits on how far away these things were. In terms of this kind of science, uh, figuring out, following up gamma ray bursts uh, as unmodeled bursts or as binary coalescence events, what we expect from advanced LIGO is that basically we'll have about five times more gamma ray bursts and ten times more sensitivity in gravitational waves. And what we expect is that the uh, uh, exclusion distances will actually start competing with exclusion distances we can set with electromagnetic observations. So we'll be getting complementary uh, information. This is all without any detection. <clears throat> the other kind of analysis you can do with gravitational wave data is that you can uh, ask the question, if I have a source at the galactic center, then what's the limit in gravitational wave energy I can set as a function of frequency for a generic burst? No information from electromagnetic uh, bursts. You're just doing a blind search. Uh, you can use various models for what the burst will be, and you can see that the limits right now already from initial LIGO are pushing down to 10 to the minus 8 uh, solar masses, uh, rest mass energy, and they can vary uh, over a couple of orders of magnitude as a function of frequency. You can reverse this same statement and ask, okay, if I have an energy of 10 to the minus 8 solar masses C square, then how far away can I see an unmodeled uh, burst in a blind search? And what you see here, the noise curves, is what initial LIGO did. So that's about 10 kiloparsecs here, on megaparsecs like for binaries. And for advanced LIGO, we're expecting to go out to maybe 100 kiloparsecs. Now, this assumes a specific energy, but actually this is not uh, a random assumption, so current theoretical predictions in terms of what gravitational wave energies we expect in core collapse supernova events that would give you these bursts. Uh, the energy ranges varies by three orders of magnitude, but this is the level of predictions we have so far, and these are the frequencies. So it's clear now that if we want adva with advanced LIGO to be detecting bursts from supernova, we, we would only core collapse supernovae, we would only be sensitive to them out to the Magellanic Clouds, okay? And throughout the Milky Way, of course. Another analysis uh, that connects to electromagnetic astronomy down the road is the following. If I have a detection of a burst purely in gravitational waves, can I say where is it coming from, <coughs> okay? Yes, but. Okay, so if you have no information on the uh, waveform, then at design sensitivity for advanced LIGO, what you expect is areas, sky areas that might include thousands of square uh, degrees, hundreds, but maybe down to, you know, one, one square degree, depending on the strength of the burst. Okay, and with a large uncertainty that has to do with different burst signals, where they are in the sky, etc. So median sky areas are 50 to 500 square degrees if there is some kind of unknown burst coming somewhere from the sky. Okay? This, is, this is worse than the early times than of gamma ray bursts, where we only had random gamma ray bursts all over with very rough localization. This is going to be rougher. The other exercise that has been done uh, and, and has been proven to be very useful for the community is the following. What if you had a gravitational wave signal? People said, okay, let's take our strongest trigger that we know was background, uh, and let's assume that was an event, and let's go through a real exercise with optical astronomers and see how fast can they respond to look up for a, uh, a counterpart. And, oh, the gray area is gone, like in the morning for another speaker. There is a whole band here that's kind of sitting here and there which is predictions, ah, these are the bands. They, these are predictions for gamma ray bursts of kilonova 
counterparts. I will not explain what this is. I hope people have heard here about Kilanova, right, uh, Ido? Um, but basically, some electromagnetic uh, signature that could come from gravitational wave, uh, from compact object mergers, and the predictions lie sort of in this band. So if you have a trigger from gravitational waves, the first observatories were able to turn and point in the right part of the sky, big part of the sky, uh, within 40 minutes and set upper limits. And you can see that all of these upper limits with various instruments uh, over 10 days are really within predictions for what we should expect for uh, kilonova counterparts. Okay? So this kind of initial exercise is now being prepared for a, on a much bigger scale with lots of uh, groups of astronomers uh, having access to various uh, telescopes um, trying to look for counterparts. And of course, sky localization from gravitational waves will be an issue. So I'll transition now to how do we get, how do we do sky localization with the laser interferometers? Uh, without getting into the technical details, there are two main methods. Actually, there's three, but we're using two. Uh, one is old-fashioned triangulation, time delays between different detectors. You figure out where your source might be coming from. Uh, but there is a, a way to do more advanced triangulation with some waveform knowledge and using not just time delays, but also phase measurements of the signal in the various detectors. So I'll call that advanced triangulation. And the other method uh, is using Bayesian parameter estimation and basically running uh, a Bayesian analysis on a chunk of data where the detection pipeline might have told you there's a signal in here, tell me what it is. So then you can go in, potentially looking for gravitational wave in spirals from double compact objects, and with detailed knowledge of the waveform, um, you can extract probability distribution function for all signal parameters, not just the sky location, but of course sky location will be uh, of interest. So there's Bayesian ways for doing parameter estimation, and that gives you the full information we can extract from gravitational wave signals, or there is triangulation. And of course, there is a trade-off between the two. You can do advanced triangulation within one to three minutes. And right now, we can do Bayesian parameter estimation uh, over maybe half an hour to a few hours to many days, depending on how much information and detail we include in our waveform knowledge. Okay? So what, I, what we've been working uh, on in the last few years in my group is actually developing an, new methodologies for, start, for doing these Bayesian parameter estimations because at the end, we don't want to just say there's detections. We want to say how massive is the black hole? How fast is it spinning? Where on the sky? How far away? Okay? And we need to measure all these parameters. If we're going to then take that step, use those measurements to constrain astrophysical models. Now, when it comes to, um, uh, let's say, an example of gamma ray bursts and electromagnetic counterparts, the time scales that are relevant are the following. You have X-ray and optical afterglows, maybe uh, uh, these are seconds, maybe 100 seconds past the actual merger. You have kilonova at 10 to the 4 or to a million seconds, and you have afterglows on much longer time scales, okay? rough predictions. So advanced triangulation can tell you something about the sky location uh, on this time scale and full parameter estimation on this time scale. So you can see we're going to talk about the trade-offs between these two, but in terms of timing, you, it's clear that we will be using advanced triangulation for the fastest possible uh, information. But the problem is that this method doesn't give you always the right information. So there's a bit of a danger there. And of course, it doesn't tell you anything about masses and spins and distance. So I want to, for what follows, I, I, I have to mention my group members over the years. Not everybody is here at, Nor is at Northwestern. Um, ben is the latest graduate student uh, uh, graduating this year. Uh, but all these guys have played a big role. And Tyson has introduced a new um, uh, ability in our data analysis, not my group, but the whole collaborations that we think is going to help us a lot down the road. And I'll tell you about that. 
So parameter estimation from binary compact objects. The problem is you may be familiar, some of you, with Markov chain Monte Carlo, so they're used across astrophysics often. Um, uh, but, but there is a particular problem with the gravitational waves in the following sense. Not only we have too many parameters compared to other astrophysics uh, problems, but also the parameter space is extremely structured and very hard to sample. Now, there's two physical parameters for non-spinning objects. The two masses, usually we refer to them as the chirp mass and the mass ratio. You don't need to pay attention much to this. And then, of course, there are geometrical parameters that are interesting. Distance, sky location, and there's an inclination of the binary, etc. So we're dealing with nine parameters when we're doing our Markov chain Monte Carlo, and we're trying to uh, match these kinds of signals to the data and extract the parameters that produce, of the source that produce these signals. So I'll show you what we can expect from advanced LIGO at design sensitivity, uh, advanced LIGO and Virgo, three detectors, for a relatively strong signal, signal to noise ratio of 20, most signals might be down to 15 or 12, so 20 is on the strong side. Um, average over noise realizations for non-spinning double neutron stars. And I'll show you what's the best you can achieve in terms of sky localization. So at 95% confidence level, you can look at this map, which is basically telling you if my source is above here on the sky, then this is the kind of sky area I'm going to get. So you can see that many of these areas at 95% confidence level are reddish. So you're here. You're below 10 square degrees. Okay? But you have these big bands of greens and blues, so that brings you up to uh, much higher uh, square degrees, sky areas. And this is a design sensitivity. When we add LIGO India, you see how everything collapses into red and very little yellow. Okay? So having a detector in the south is really important. It's not really in the south, but it, it's, it's a different orientation. Um, uh, we would have liked Australia, but anyhow, it didn't work. Um, uh, but it's going to be a huge improvement. It's really important to get that extra detector. We're going to be down to a few square degrees. That sounds much better than hundreds of degrees to optical astronomers. Okay. <coughs> Oops, that little label was not supposed to appear there. So I showed you what to expect at design sensitivity, three detectors, signal to noise ratio of 20. This is golden times. Okay. We're not going to be at golden times. So what if your signal-to-noise ratio, not immediately, what if the, your signal-to-noise ratio is low? Well, um, I won't explain the plot in detail, but basically uh, if you have a distribution of signals uh, above signal-to-noise ratios of 8 instead of being stuck at the nice 20, then 90% of the error boxes on the sky will have areas greater than 10 square degrees. 40% of the error boxes will have uh, error boxes greater than 100 square degrees. Okay? These are big chunks of the sky. This is at design sensitivity with a distribution of signal to noise ratio. It, it's, if we want to do astronomy with gravitational waves and with LIGO, we need to be preparing to be able to scan these kinds of sky areas, not one degree. Okay, because that's not going to happen very often. Now, what if we come closer? That was design sensitivity. What about um, the first three-month run in 2015, a year from now? What can be done? <clears throat> well, it turns out, I'll first tell you and then, and then point to the plot. We're going to have two LIGO detectors, no Virgo. That makes a sky localization really hard. The advanced triangulation is actually as good as what you can get with a Bayesian analysis. And the Bayesian analysis takes, right now, much longer. So we'll be relying on advanced triangulation. What you're seeing here is a cumulative distribution um, of the number of events that have an area of uh, 10 degrees, 100 degrees, 1,000 degrees. 
Okay? So this is where you are, 100 to 1,000 degrees. And blue and red, advanced triangulation and base, give you exactly the same distribution. So you're not gaining anything from parameter estimation. This is for non-spinning double neutron stars. In 2016, we'll have La Virgo joining us. It will be less sensitive than LIGO. At that time, oh, my transition, OK. <clears throat> At that time, parameter estimation will make a difference. So you see how now blue and red are separated. And you get smaller sky uh, areas with actual Markov chain Monte Carlo. But that takes longer now. So our effort is to make that shorter, bring it down to less than an hour. So if you can do this relatively quickly, over hours, then your sky uh, areas will decrease by a factor of about three to five. So that's definitely a significant improvement. You're going to go from um, you know, 300 degrees to 60 degrees, square degrees. The reason this happens, you, you might say, why? OK, so the reason this happens is that when you're doing simple triangulation and Virgo very often being less sensitive, will not detect anything. So you're still dealing with two detectors. But the, the, parameter, the Bayesian analysis uh, takes into account the fact that Virgo was on and saw nothing. And that actually helps you restrict your sky uh, localization to smaller areas. And that's why uh, you get better results. Now let me move on to what else are we going to learn from the other parameters. What about distance to the source, which could also be important for electromagnetic observations, masses, and binary inclination. So let me stick to distance and inclination together. Um, there is a very clear, now well understood, uh, degeneracy between distance and inclination. And when you're doing the parameter uh, estimation, you're basically getting these kinds of uh, confidence levels that uh, 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 give you, if you project the distribution in inclination or in distance, you get very broad uncertainties. Okay? And the reason is that you're struggling with this uh, correlation between distance and inclination. There are some times where the source on the sky is at a favorable place compared to the detectors that you can break this degeneracy and then you get a nice little blob and then you can see that your distance estimate is uh, uh, quite better but you can do you can get distance information only through parameter estimation so that will take more time and the typical uncertainties are going to be a factor of two or three okay so distance estimates will have these kinds of errors. Masses. Obviously, we want to measure masses. I'm showing you here what can be done for double neutron stars again. And basically, if you're dealing with equal mass binaries, uh, then you can measure the mass uh, within 10%. If you have unequal masses, then you can get an even better measurement. That's the red spikes here. So a few to 10% is what we'll be able to be doing for masses. Now remember, in X-ray binaries, black hole masses are often, they have error bars you know, for factors of two or so. So measuring black hole masses will be from a, a large sample will be a big deal in terms of understanding what's going on with the black hole mass distribution and black hole mass gaps, et cetera. Now, I said I will return back to the issue of the noise. <clears throat> LIGO, the signals are buried in the noise. A lot of new methodology has been developed in the data analysis to extract it from the noise. However, all of that analysis, most of the analysis, assumes that the noise is stationary and Gaussian. Okay? And then you're building your signal to noise ratio uh, through uh, applied math methodologies. But in practice, the noise is not Gaussian and it's not stationary. And only now the collaboration is coming to grips with that at some level. So let me show you what happens with uh, calculating chirp mass uh, and mass ratio for binaries if you now have different realizations of the noise. 
you start getting biases, and the biases can get much worse. Chirp mass is a nice parameter because you can measure it down to you know, a few percent. Uh, so maybe it's not that important for the chirp mass, but for other parameters, for distances, noise can create a lot of problems in parameter estimation, not just in burying the signal. So the solution we've been working on for the last few years with uh, one of the postdocs in the, in the group is that we actually have to find a way to model the non-Gaussian, non-stationary part of the noise simultaneously with the signal. So we've been working on developing uh, uh, data analysis methods that can fit for broadband noise, lines, and glitches. And we can leave the number of noise features, these glitches, as a free parameter as well, and do the full nine-dimensional plus these parameters all together. <coughs> Why do we need all of that? Because LIGO has this broadband noise that you've seen before. Um, green is the data. Then it has lines from all kinds of modes that give you very narrow band noise uh, in the detector. So we can fit those with Lorentzians. And then from time to time, there's non-Gaussian, actually sometimes very often, there's non-Gaussian noise. The instrument goes through glitches. Okay, so you get disturbances that are very localized in frequency and time. Guess what? What, what do you think a burst looks like in, in a time frequency domain? It looks exactly like a glitch. Okay, uh, and even an in-spiral of a binary black hole that has a short duration inside the LIGO band looks like a glitch sometimes. So we need to be able to do this properly in order to be uh, firm that we have a detection. So the problem is, as I said, that you have non-Gaussian, the glitches are a main issue, and non-stationary. I was being a little unfair when I said the collaboration is only now coming to grips with this issue. There are lots of frequentist um, ways to sort of put v empir develop empirical vetoes for how to avoid all these uh, artifacts in the noise, etc. But the problem is that even with that, that will save you for detection. But if you don't treat the noise in your parameter estimation, you're going to get the wrong masses and wrong sky location, potentially. So we've, uh, we have embarked on a noise modeling effort, which basically allows us to transform the noise into Gaussian noise. So this is just a demonstration of what is your residuals uh, left over after thinking that you took care of what your detector is doing uh, without truly fitting it online? So if you, know you assume, if you assume you know the noise ahead of time, then you are left with these fat tails that deviate from a pure nice Gaussian, which is the green line. Okay? And with the uh, realization that we can actually fit for the signal, then we can look at the residuals when there is no signal, and we can see that we bring the residuals down to Gaussian, so then the parameter estimation uh, assumptions are actually valid, and we don't get biases in our parameter extraction. So here's an example, again, on the best uh, extracted uh, parameters for uh, chirp mass, and you can see how the shape of your uh, uh, probability distribution function can be affected by not dealing with the noise properly. Even worse, glitches, as I mentioned, can really uh, uh, create a lot of problems. So here's an example with a signal that is injected, a binary black hole, at these masses, close to 100 solar masses and 20-some solar masses. So this is the injection. And this is what the standard extraction of the parameters will give you if you think you don't have to do anything special with the noise, okay? But there's a glitch in the data. Um, when, you, when you do the uh, online fitting, um, I'm sorry, these are, yes. So there is glitch in the data, and here the noise has been cleaned up, and it's Gaussian, and you can recover the true value, all right? Another uh, 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 scary situation is that if you have a, a glitch, let's say you have a, a data stream of data, a, a, a stream of LIGO data, 
and you inject a signal. That's what we can do so far since we don't have real signals. So you've injected the red signal. But it turns out your detector misbehaved and it has a glitch at some point. When you run the analysis of detection without any noise modeling, the pipeline stops at the glitch and thinks it found an in-spiral of this length. That will give you very wrong parameters. The true injected signal is here. And when we now uh, model with noise, then we recover the injected signal. Okay, so these are all examples of how having ignored the noise um, uh, while extracting physical parameters has been a problem. Yes? It's, it's some kind of a, uh, it's some kind of a jerking of the detector that appears. It could be seismic, but that can be monitored very well. The problem with what we call glitches are the things that are, look like bursts, like something sudden happened to the detector, narrow in frequency, narrow in time, and we cannot attribute it to a known source. So seismic, we can attribute it to a noise, known, known source. But sometimes the electronics misbehave, the suspension system may go through a glitch. So it's basically unknown origin, and it shows that your detector is not behaving like a nice Gaussian machine. But that's why you have two detectors at least. That, that's nice true. That Excellent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this. Is that fundamentally how you know they're not signals? So here's the problem. Um, uh, yes, actually, the, I'm, I'm coming to exactly this point. So I'll go directly to answer your question, Erwin, and then I'll tell you what the point I was about to make. Here's the glitch. This is how it looks. Where are we? Here, this is how it looks in Livingstone. And you run your pipeline, and it thinks it's a signal. And it fits it beautifully. It fits it beautifully. Okay. Now, of course, if you then look at the other detector, um, by eye in this case, you can tell there was nothing there. Okay. Now, maybe there was nothing there because the orientation of the source, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but the analysis pipeline thinks there is something there, and it tries, it tries to fit it. So normally, if it if the glitches are they're incoherent, independently the two detectors. And normally, you can clean up you know, tens of thousands of glitches in the detection pipeline without doing anything special with those empirical videos I talked about. But there are tens of events in initial LIGO um, that escape all the vetoes. And then if you go humanly one by one and you look at them, you can tell, OK, this is fishy. OK, this is not a detection. We're not going to be fooled. But the problem is the following. We don't know that the advanced detector is going to be as stable as initial LIGO, especially the first few years. So if you end up with a 1,000 triggers that pass the pipeline, then how are you going to look at them one by one and figure out that they were the wrong thing instead of notifying electromagnetic telescopes and telling them to go and cover hundreds of degrees of the sky? So the, the, we need to come up with an auto, there, there is a need for an automated way to um, uh, clean the data, basically. And that the only way to do that is to do it simultaneously as you're doing the fitting with the signal. OK? So indeed, as you said, that's why you have two detectors. But then you would have to look at these suspicious ones that pass the cuts. You would have to look at them one by one and say, well, that's not a signal, clearly. So the automated way actually boils down to doing what we call in Bayesian analysis model selection. <coughs> All right, you want when you're doing a Bayesian analysis and you're calculating uh, 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 likelihoods and uh, and probability distribution factors, you can actually marginalize over all your parameters and calculate the evidence for a given model. And if you want to claim a detection, you need well, at least the collaboration agrees that we need to ourselves, we need to prove that the signal model has a higher evidence than noise model. Okay? So the signal you just saw, the glitch that it's an artifact, 
past the pipeline. If you then ask the question, okay, I'm gonna ask what is the evidence that this was a signal versus the evidence that this was noise? The signal is favored over noise by this enormous factor. This is log evidence. This is likelihoods, log. Okay, you look at this, you know, okay, if it's one signal, you're gonna go look at it by eye and you know you cannot trust this. But if you're doing this automated, you're looking at this, you're claiming detection, okay? I don't want to scare you, why am I doing this? Anyhow, we're not gonna claim detection uh, without these tools incorporated. Here's what's going on though. This kind of evidence, when you're asking your data, is the noise model favored over the signal model? The question that was asked here is, is Gaussian noise favored over the signal model? And because there is a glitch, yes, the signal model is more favored. If you're doing, if you have a way of modeling the glitches online, you can then ask the question, wh what is the evidence for Gaussian noise? What is the evidence for signal, this huge bar I showed you? What is the evidence that this was an incoherent glitch artifact in the data? And it's actually favored. It looks like a small difference, but again, this is log evidence. Okay, so the evidence for a glitch over a hypothetical signal is higher by this factor. Okay, so then you know you don't have a signal. And this now can be done automated. So if you have hundreds of these, we don't have to look at them one by one. Last, in the last five minutes, I want to bring up uh, spins. And actually, the reason I got into physical parameter estimation was because I wanted to um, see how we're gonna extract spin information, especially for the black holes, from the in spirals, okay? <clears throat> so the problem with spins is that they're both a blessing and a curse. Here's what spins can do uh, to an in spiral waveform. I'm gonna watch this one minute. It's gonna keep playing. When you have spins, in this case we have two spins and they are misaligned compared to the orbital angular momentum vectors. What you get is precession, okay? All three vectors, the two spins, red and blue, and the orbital angular momentum, uh, they're all precessing because of spin orbit and spin-spin couplings. The orbital plane of your binary is also precessing, so the projection of the in-spiral signal on your detector uh, has modulations. The kinds of modulations you see is that you no longer have a nice, clean chirp, but you have these uh, you know, lo uh, lower frequency um, modulations on top of it. The other problem in terms of extracting information with spin is that now instead of having nine dimensions that I talked about before, you now have 15 because you're adding two vectors. And not only that, but the spins can um, correlate with masses and mass ratio especially and can uh, bias your extraction if you don't know you're dealing with a spinning signal. So we're having to deal with a higher dimensional space that is more complex, and the Markov chain Monte Carlo basically chokes. If you just take the old codes we had for non-spinning signals and you run it on a spinning signal, it took three years to get a code advanced enough to run on spinning signals without choking. You would wait for months to get parameters. If you ignore the spin, then you can get the parameter measurements to be biased. I'll show you a couple of examples. The good thing with spin, though, is that sometimes it actually helps you break a degeneracy. So sometimes, if you model it, then you can get more accurate mass determinations, you can get a better sky localization, and you can, of course, measure spins. So here's an example of a signal that was injected, uh, and this is a sky map, and the signal was injected at this location. When we did the analysis, and it was a spinning signal, when we did the analysis with non-spinning uh, models, the green is what you got for the contours for where the source is. When you do it with a spinning model, this is what you get. OK? 
Okay, so obviously that can have a big implication for how we're going to go after uh, electromagnetic counterparts. Mass measurements. I showed you how they are robust, but actually spin can screw those up as well. Here's an injection, which is obviously a neutron star, uh, 1.4, and a black hole, a very massive black hole. That's the cross. With non-spinning, this is where you think your masses are. Okay? With the spinning analysis, you still get an island here, but you get most of the likelihood right where you need it to be. So these kinds of biases are actually not uncommon. Okay? So the measurements, sky localization, masses, if we're having a binary black hole that ha exhibits a lot of the precession I showed you, and your analysis cannot handle the complications of spinning signals, then we're going to be measuring wrong things. Um, so in the sky localization, it has to do a bit with the symmetry and the fact that the two detectors are uh, almost al nearly aligned, and you get the genesis. You, with three detectors, better off. This one, uh, this one is two detectors. Uh, this analysis with three detectors, you can uh, shrink your error bar. But there are still, even with three detectors, if you have a non-detection in the third detector, because the third detector will not be as sensitive, then you can again have two blobs that are degenerate. So the spin breaks the degeneracy here. And here, in the masses, the, the, the lack of spin in the modeling uh, basically shifts the masses, so it tries to fit that modulated um, uh, chirp with a simple chirp, and it biases your masses, even though what you have is really spin there. So we have about one year to um, advance our spinning analysis. Right now, for, as I said, for three years, we were, we were the only group focusing on the spin. Um, and now uh, there's at least one other code that can handle it. But the problem, the problem we're having is that it's taking too long to do physical parameter estimation in 15 dimensions. Okay? It, that's when, remember the range I gave you? 30 minutes, hours, days, sometimes is 10 days. Okay? That's the spinning signals. So we, we need to improve this, and we don't have much time. It's all applied math, to be honest. It's not astrophysics. Um, so we need to do smart and physically motivated Markov chain Monte Carlo schemes that take advantage of our knowledge of our waveforms. Uh, we'll be use we've already started using some machine learning methods and some non-Markovian explorations. I'm not explaining this, but for the connoisseurs, uh, you may know what, you, what I mean. Basically, what we want to do is do this. Okay? We know we're not going to be doing full parameter estimation within a minute. We don't think we can do that. But I think we can do it within a day, a few hours. Okay. So um, uh, we need also to be able to do model selection in non-Gaussian noise and not be misled by glitches. Uh, and of course, we'd like to use spin-induced modulations to our advantage. So at the end, we want to measure massive spins um, uh, no comma there, use mass spin measurements for astrophysical studies. So at the end, what we really, what I'm interested in is whatever measurements we get, we go back to the astrophysical predictions, which is where I started from. Okay? So actually, hopefully we're going to get either upper limits, but hopefully measurements of in spiral rates that are going to come into the astrophysics area. Uh, and from that, I didn't finish my sentence, we can constrain, we can learn more about the pulsar luminosity function and, of course, about the binary evolution that leads to these rate predictions. If we can just measure masses accurately, then maybe we'll be probing the neutron star equation of state. It would be nice to find a 2.5 solar mass neutron star. And, of course, we're going to be, again, uh, constraining single and binary evolution. If we can measure spin magnitudes, especially in black holes. We're going to be probing a very different regime than the one we're probing with X-ray binaries and the, spin, and the spin measurements. The reason is that binary compact objects don't go through the kind of 
uh, long-term raw slope overflow accretion phase that the X-ray binaries we're using for black hole spin measurements now go through. In fact, what we will be probing with, with LIGO is what happens in terms of spin-up during common envelopes, which is unstable mass transfer for those who know. Um, but also for the second compact object, we'll be measuring the birth spin. We have no way in, in regular astrophysics, in electromagnetic astrophysics, to get to the birth spin for black holes. Uh, we can also measure the tilts. And for that, uh, this connects to something I discussed at the ITC lunch. But we may be getting, if we can measure the tilts for both compact objects in these binary compact objects, again, we'll be probing at what happened during the core collapse and how do neutron stars and black holes get their spins um, at formation. And also, uh, we're going to be able to make a statement about whether these binary compact objects are coming mostly from dense regions where they formed or from the field. The reason is that if they're coming from isolated binary evolution, the first born compact object is expected to be relatively aligned, small tilts. By tilt, I mean spin orbit misalignment angle. If they are formed in dense clusters, then we should have a range of different spin tilts for both compact objects. So you need big samples to make that statement. You can make that statement with one. But we're not in this game for one detection. And last, let me finish with transient multi-messenger astronomy and some of the challenges and the, the, the vision. Okay, so non-gravitational waves and gravitational waves will have to work together, uh, either as triggers or counterparts. So gravitation, LIGO and Virgo can use triggers from electromagnetic waves. Uh, we've already done it with gamma ray bursts. Or um, uh, it could be that, and looking for gravitational wave counterparts, or the other way around. Non-gravitational waves, of course, electromagnetic. But who knows? Maybe a supernova in the galaxy, there could be neutrinos. There are already established pipelines for simultaneous analysis of gravitational waves and neutrino data from IceCube. And for gravitational waves, we're after bursts and in spirals. And what we'd like to be probing is basically uh, what's going on in core collapse supernovae, what is going on in gamma ray bursts, either long gamma ray bursts or short gamma ray bursts. What is going on with kilonova, which of course are connected to short gamma ray bursts, but the physics is very different than the gamma ray burst er engine. What is going on with gamma ray bursts afterglows, and also uh, uh, learning more about magnetars that I mentioned early on. So at the end, we're focusing now on prompt data analysis, accurate data analysis, and extracting the information. The focus has shifted already beyond the detection. We're trying to measure things, and we better measure them accurately, because at the end, we want to go back to our astrophysical detections. So I'll stop here, and thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions. Two questions. Yeah. Two questions. One is, is LIGO going to be sensitive to any binaries? Forgetting about in spirals, just binaries which we can see optically, and that we can tell whether they get the right period or not. Is there going to be any calibration of this sort? Unfortunately, no. So LIGO is sensitive to the frequency regime, which is um, advanced LIGO will be maybe as low as 10 hertz up to 1,000 hertz, and regular binaries with regular stars, even two white dwarfs, uh, are all below. 0.1 hertz. So it's orders of magnitude at lower frequencies. That's why we need a space-based mission. Oh. But that's another discussion. <laughs> and another question which is somewhat related is Virgo has much greater sensitivity at lower frequencies. Yes. What are they doing differently that LIGO couldn't do, for example? So one of the things that uh, Advanced LIGO is implementing in terms of the upgrade is a better seismic uh, isolation system. So trying to uh, isolate the detector from the seismic activity at frequencies below 40 hertz. The, that technology, Virgo, which came later compared to initial LIGO, implemented it from the beginning. So they have the advanced seismic isolation system, and advanced LIGO will get it. 
but it's not that then Virgo will also become again even lower at frequencies. Virgo in terms of the low frequency noise will stay where basically initial Virgo was. So Vicky, you said uh, that one of the things you hope is to measure, uh, find out about the equation of set of neutron stars by looking at the Masses. massive news. But how? So let's say that you can measure the uh, mass of the object. How do you tell if it's a neutron star or black hole? It's, uh, you can't. So what I meant here is that uh, if you have, that's where we need electromagnetic <coughs> information. So um, if you find that two, if you measure masses and they are 2.5 and four, or 2.5 and 1.4, gravitational waves alone, uh, in, uh, uh, in the simple case, cannot tell you you're dealing with a neutron star. It could be two black holes, okay? Maybe we'll feel the black hole mass gap, but we cannot tell if it's a neutron star. There are two ways to tell. One is electromagnetic information. So if there is an afterglow, you need you, you had matter. Okay. Now, if your my my example was bad. If you're if you're two and a half and one point three, you can't tell that two and a half is a neutron star. But if it's two and a half and ten, then and you have an electromagnetic counterpart, then you know your two and a half must be a neutron star. The other way, purely on the gravitational wave side, is if you can get um, uh, the merger part of the in-spiral, which I didn't talk about, uh, but if you can probe that part, then you can uh, constrain the neutron star equation of state because two binary black holes merging in those late stages behave differently than a neutron star and a black hole or two neutron stars. So for that, it would need to be a strong signal, um, and, uh, and and we should and with numerical. It used to be a big question because numerical relativity couldn't do the simulations, right? It's no longer an issue. We think we can get the major signal uh, well characterized to be able to detect it if it's there, if it's not at too high a frequency. <laughs> So if you were to see a real event in one detector, how frequently would it actually not be there in the second detector? Oh, thousands of times. Uh, so it depends how long your data chunk is, etc. Uh, but we're dealing, so a false trigger that now let's say survives the detector, the, it, depending on how long your chunk is, your data chunk. Um, okay, I can give it to you. Let me think. So if we had, I think we're talking about 10,000 to 100,000 of those per year. It's a, lot, it's a lot of things that happen in one detector and don't happen in the other. But if, if it were a real astrophysical event? Oh, that's you what you're asking. To only be it really, de I can't give you a quantitative answer. It really depends where it is on the sky and what's the source. Uh, and whether it's spinning or not. Um, so depending on what kind of binary it is and where it is on, on the sky. There are, yeah, I, I can't give you even a fraction. It, um, I would have to, maybe if I, if I went back to sky maps and the sensitivity Virgo and LIGO, we could get a sense of the relative area, but still that wouldn't give you an actual number. Sorry. Yeah, how do things happen on Earth can affect the detection? For example, earthquake. The small scale earthquake happen every day. Yeah. And there are places there. Uh, the place on Earth there happen to be the same distance to all three detectors that you have. The track, uh, so you could have a coherent seismic, coherent seismic noise. You mean? No, I, I mean if it's uh, either you have a false detection or you can. The small earthquake can distort the real detection. In fact, you you know to just destroy your real signal. So each but detector has seismometers that can can track seismic activity um, as a function of frequency. So the the seismic activity, if you if you saw the noise curves, the isolation system is. Um, good enough to basically isolate the detector from any seismic activity that is uh, for initial LIGO less than 40 hertz uh, and for advanced LIGO it could <coughs> go down to 10 hertz. So if it's above those frequencies, 
you might see it in one detector, it will appear like a glitch, but you will know from the seismometers that it was a seismic glitch, and that you can be doing the data. Now, I think you asked something about certain locations in the Earth where if something happens, seismic activity, then maybe it will arrive simultaneously at all three yes. detectors. So that has low probability. It might appear like a coherent burst, but again, the seismometers will detect it. And if it's in the frequency, in this high frequency range, these are rare, loud events that are <coughs> usually identified also by geoscientists. So um, we're not really worried about being fooled by a seismic event as appearing as a coherent signal. And we've really overflowed our time. Now let's thank Vicky again for wonderful <laughs>